Everything's coming up greener. Here's Harold Matthews. He is the Garden Doctor. The Garden Doctor. Hello, Connersville, and welcome to the Garden Doctor Show. Right here, live, coming to you from this big metropolis of uh, Connersville. Yes, live. Way tonight. up here on the 14th floor. Aren't we on the 13th, 14th uh, we're floor? We're way up there. We are I don't way know. up, and we can see the whole city of Connersville. It's it's just absolutely amazing. Isn't this where the new uh, City Cam is that yeah, they show I, I on the news? I think so. Yeah, yeah, you see that thing on the news? Be careful. You know, I used to streak Connorsville at least twice a month. I had to make them stop. I had to stop. <laughs> you know, we got the city cam and all of this. You, nobody knows what streaking is anymore anyway. Anyway, welcome to the show. Um, we had a little uh, respite from the cold and the uh, rainy and all of that nonsense. And it's back! Yay! Yeah, it snowed on us out of nowhere a couple of weeks back. Yeah, we had a nice snow. Sure As a matter of fact, I tried to stretch the season like so many people do about two weeks ago some of the local shops around here got in tomato plants and I know better and I knew better and I preach better but you uh, did it anyway I did it anyway yeah I, it was a test Couldn't wait I will show you later in the show what the results of that test were I tried to plant three plants early there is a reason why certain plants are planted at certain times and there are there are all sorts of charts that explain to you, plant this here, plant this now, plant this then. Uh, and there's the, you really should pay attention to those because the maximum result of that plant will um, complement you and uh, bring forth fruit if you follow those simple directions that say don't plant your beans until what's it say on beans oh uh, what does it say on beans it tells you it not to plant until mid-may for your beans yes and now, that's in the farmer's almanac and there's a reason why mid-may is a good time to plant beans number one the soil has warmed up beans don't okay. like cold soil so you have to have warmer soil. They don't like wet conditions. They rot in the ground. Whereas peas love it cold. And peas love wet conditions that we get in early spring. And what does it say to plant peas? Oh, well, peas. My goodness. I didn't know there was going to be a with quiz. A Hold on. I have to go alphabetical. Starts with a P. She's a peas, 1st of April. It says first of April. start peas. Now, now in that's here, outdoors. This I, gives an indoor and outdoor starting guide, but I'm going strictly by outdoors because that's, that's what we do. That's what I'm asking about. Okay. Now the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Sit on your chin. Well, good. It'll fly, fly away. Okay. The all of that stuff, the cold weather uh, plants. It says to wait until what is it, April or something. But let me tell you, if that ground can be worked in March and you can get out there and cover the ground with clear plastic, warm the ground up a little bit little bit and put these plants in they will produce the best crops you've ever had now you may lose some it may frost and I actually did have a frost a freeze and snow on my broccoli Brussels sprouts cauliflower kale cabbage and chard it only damaged the chard a little bit I lost some leaves on the cauliflower, but for the most part, it just it just frosted them a little bit. Didn't do them any damage. Well, I see them coming back now. They're starting oh, to look they're, like they're yeah, they're, gaining they're hold strong. Again. Yes, uh, they've, their root structure has grown down deep. Uh, they're in very vigorous condition, and they should uh, result in some very good uh, fruit. Now, one year we had the most fabulous. We planted them in March, the end of March. Uh, this broccoli, and we had about four rows of broccoli, and we used the self-blanching cauliflower and we cut broccoli the big heads cut it off and then there would be two big heads and we cut that off and then would be four a little bit smaller but they'd cover the same area we cut those off and then there would be six or eight and this kept going this kept going <laughs> i don't think we've ever had broccoli or cauliflower again to match that year they that were was a great absolutely year. Was. Fabulous. Yes. Now I side dressed with uh, organics. I like to use manure on the sides, 
Um, I also did some side dressing of fertilizer. I, I try to use seaweed a lot uh, for my fertilizer because it gives a full spectrum of the nutrients. And it also makes the, the, the fruit taste better. Whether it does or not, just let me keep believing Makes that. Makes him feel better. Yeah. That's all that matters. <laughs> that's, yeah. and most of this stuff is, is dog food where you look at it and you think it's, it looks good to you, so the dog must like it. But, sure. um, uh, and, and I always try to do organic wherever I can uh, control of the insects and the diseases with uh, either a natural spray, which, by the way, I have to compliment uh, Christopher and Jennifer on their... Uh, show that just aired here. Oh, that here was fabulous. I ago. just got a chance to watch their show and Christopher and Jen, you guys did a great job. I was impressed and I learned a lot. I did listening to your show. I thought it was very well done. And one of the things that she talked about on the show was using garlic as a natural control yes. for insects, which we have done for years. You can also use the leaves of the tomato plant, the nightshade plants. You can make a tea out of those and and it, uh, if you mix the garlic with the nightshade you will get a very very effective control and it will not have an effect on your fruit long term so you can spray it on wash it off uh, the day before harvest and still eat the uh, eat the um, uh, fruit with with uh, uh, the confidence that it's been treated all organically now wherever possible I'll go out and pick the bugs off and that really is the method of control that you should you should try to do when Whenever possible. Sometimes just getting rid of the lower leaves can help a lot. I know on tomato plants, for example, if you just trim up the bottom foliage yeah, to get them do up that. away yeah. from the ground. Just to kind of keep any, you know, uh, crowding leaf, damp Let some area. Air circulation right. get in there. Um, and also so that the insects that travel across the ground can't get onto the leaves as easy. Uh, and if we have a, uh, one of the plants that seems to be attacked with something, we will dispose of that plant uh, as quickly as we can to get it up and out of the, uh, so that it doesn't affect everything else that's in there. But I have to tell you, my favorite part of Christopher and Jen's show uh, was, of course, the wonderful outtake they took of our grandchildren, and they were absolutely adorable doing Both their them, little activity, were they? by the way, take directly from their grandfather. <laughs> uh, the intelligence of the older one and the tenacity of the younger one. Both both are mine. Both both come directly. Well, you know. luck, I'm lucky enough that you and your ex-wife, Dina, their grandma, have, uh, have agreed to share the grandkids with me. I'm, I didn't I'm, say anything about uh, oh, um, sharing with you. Share yes. With oh, okay. Me. I, I thought you were talking yes. about credit. No, we don't. No, no, no. I don't share any credit with her. <laughs> I ain't gonna share it with you. But they share their grandchildren with me, yes. and they, they're my grandchildren too. <laughs> now I tell you, if they, uh, Christopher and Jennifer, know how Rowan is. And this is a ball of fire you waiting to explode. You notice her stirring explode. the whole time. Keep her busy with something. They kept stirring, her busy stirring, and stirring. somehow she didn't talk. <laughs> stirring, I don't know stirring, if stirring. they shoved a hot pepper down her throat or what they did. She just kept but, stirring. Yeah, she just kept on <laughs> and stirring. Nodding. And mashing. And, yeah. <laughs> it was Very a beautiful cute. job, though. And I did, I did pick up some things. They are constantly telling us that they learn things from our show. So apparently they must be watching it because I quiz them every once in a while. Oh, there's going to be a quiz. So and look out. They can quiz me because I did, in fact, watch it all the way through. And I did pick up something else, too. Uh, and before we get off on all of this and other And don't forget, stuff. this is a live show. Oh, Monday yeah, live tonight. show. That's yes, right. Yes, Monday right. night, right here, live. Give us a call. You know, I don't... If we say live now and then they play the repeat, how it's do they know live. it's not live when it's live? It's, or it's live, not live now, but not later. But today it's live right now. Okay, so if it's later... Then it's not live. Right, but if that? it's now, it's live. Gotcha. It's okay. A simple thing. That's it's how very you know. simple. Very oh, easy. you see the little thing down there? It says well, live. Yeah, that's it. I thought that was talking right. about the see plant. See the phone number? Can you read that from here? I thought that meant the the plant is no, alive. Oh, that's we're oh, alive. That's we're alive. I'm glad we're still alive. So that's what a good do they thing. put up when we're not? <laughs> I don't know. Ah, <laughs> not what? live. I not live. Ah! A little circle with a slash through yeah. it. When and it's they a make us disappear against this background. I don't know. Okay, what the heck was I talking about? That's too about? advanced for me. Like oh, yeah, the smartphone. other thing that I learned from Jennifer 
uh, is the length uh, that you can keep your spices before they go bad. I didn't know that you only had three months on pepper. If you buy pepper, the minute you open that pepper up and you start to use it, three months later, the benefits of the pepper are gone. Well, gee, most of my spices need to go right in the trash right now. Then. We have spices <laughs> that How have many years? May flour <laughs> on the bottom of them. Not so. that bad. Come well, on. Yeah, we, <laughs> well, yeah. things you don't use every day all the time, they can end up hanging around yeah, for get quite a while. Stuff. Come on. So. Start with new. But the peppercorn, you know, where you grind the peppers. And I'll tell you something. There are... Many, many um, uh, people that uh, this salt that she's talking about, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the did Celtic you say we had a call? Oh, well, you better keep Did you say we had a call? I thought we had a caller come in. I don't think we had a call. I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, she's talking. One she's second. I don't know. Talking, See, we have people talking, talking about the ear. Celtic salt. We're talking to you. And That's um, how it goes. Um, the Celtic salt that and the uh, pink salt, great stuff. Absolutely yes. wonderful stuff. And it has all of the minerals and all of the, um, uh, the positives in it without any of the negatives. And um, uh, and it's and it's not bleached and blanched and, and wore out. So anyway, that their show was great, fantastic yes. show. And I thought they did a good job. Very good. And there is somebody on the line. Go ahead. There You're on, okay. on the air with the garden doctor. What can I do for you? Hi. Um, how do you keep the rabbits away from the uh, broccoli? Well, if you can find an answer, we'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have an answer. No, we, we, do. Actually, okay. we bought an old dog pen. Yeah, this is the way we had to we do it. We put up a dog pen. And inside the dog pen, we raise our, our broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower. Well, two years but, in a row, we've put out plants, and the next day, there's just a sprig there. Meow. That's it. So, and, uh, uh, But there are other ways. There are other ways. Blood meal is beneficial. And there is a product that is out there that's called... Um, uh, what line are, something. Well, what's um, the critter ritter? Is that critter for ritter. Uh, critter rabbits? ritter? But you, but some of these products read the label and see if they can be used around edible um, uh, products. Now, see, it's uh, a chemical. human hair, yeah. especially ladies' hair, is very effective. But it is only effective as long as the odor stays there. You know, all the dyes and all the sprays and all the stuff. The, the rabbits don't like and that stuff. And what about the, uh, the crushed deer don't red like pepper. that stuff? Crushed that, red pepper that I've, you would sprinkle. We've I've tried seen that. Buzzards fall off. Never mind. <laughs> no, but um, crushed red pepper is another um, product that works. And as Jennifer said on the show, uh, on their show, uh, what's their show called? Uh, I can't Good remember. Health. Why would you ask me? <laughs> Home Homegrown Health. health. See, yes. I remembered. I was, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Home, uh, as they said on Homegrown Health, um, uh, mixing up uh, garlic and uh, Tabasco sauce uh, or, or hot sauce and spraying it on your plants is very effective at, at keeping the rabbits off. Do you off. spray it on the plants or uh, around the plants? Spray it right on the plants because that is safe to use on the plants. That Does is very, help very safe. Just growing nearby the garlic, or uh, no, the garlic has to be used as a tea. So oh. you crush up some garlic, boil you it make water a tea, or something, and um, uh, then you spray that on the plants. Oh, and okay. um, uh, if you use, if you mix in with that some red cayenne pepper or some uh, some hot sauce, the hotter the better. If you mix that in, it gives it an, an extra jolt. And you will have to reapply that because unlike a chemical, It'll wash right off. you don't yeah. want the chemical will stay with it forever and ever. And if you're trying to be organic, you'll have to keep reapplying these natural things because they do get diluted and washed away. So right, that's the right downside. Right to the plant or on the ground by the Right way. on the plant and the ground around it. Right directly okay. on the plant. And okay. you'll find that there's so much coming up uh, for the rabbits now. When you plant your, your broccoli, normally the, the, there's very little out there because you're planting the end of March or the first of yeah, April. They ate our shrubs, terrible, everything. They was chewed just... up our trees, they chewed up my blackberries, my raspberries. And <laughs> that's why we everything. resorted to planting in a cage to keep the animals out, it's uh, terrible. Yeah, I know. We, but 
uh, and part of it's because I'm just not as good a shot as I used to be. <laughs> Stop that. No, anyway. We don't have Tiny anymore, so she yeah, doesn't keep the rabbit population down. Yeah, Tiny doesn't take care of the rabbit down. population. Yeah. But, there, but there are some commercial mm -hmm. products out there that we have been successful with on non-edible crops. Yeah, Critter Ritter is one of them, but we've Critter not Ritter, used and it there's on a whole vegetables. bunch like that. Got to read it. Yeah. But yeah, you have to read it very carefully, and we use it as a perimeter mm -hmm. so that the rabbits don't come in. But then inside the garden, we spray with the organics, uh, the garlic, and the red pe red pepper, and also baby powder has been effective. They sprinkle yeah. it around. Yeah, baby powder is a very effective uh, deterrent for squirrels. Um, and for, um, well, most rodents actually, but squirrels in particular that like to dig up uh, bulbs, uh, crocus and, and tulip mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Yep. Mm -hmm. We'll give those so things a try. you have to constantly apply it then. Uh, you will, uh, unless it doesn't rain, if you have good weather and you've put a good dose on, mm -hmm. uh, but again, the rabbits will go somewhere else. If that tastes bitter to them, which the garlic will make it taste bad, and mm -hmm. so will the red cayenne pepper, if once they have an alternative of, of clovers, and we have all of my lawns are, are sowed with clovers and all the perimeters of the fields I've sowed with clovers. And they don't even bother our gardens once the clovers start to grow, which is about a week ago. So oh, okay. about a week ago, the rabbits stopped bothering my garden, even though we left the gate open. <laughs> I know, I saw that. On two different <laughs> occasions. And I say we because it means I opened it and she failed of to course. close it. Of course. <laughs> So it's a wee thing. But so. I know they can be a challenge. They really, they got us so bad every year for the last few years. And oh, then yeah, we they, went to the cage. We, thing, we grew but, and grew and grew uh, for three weeks and went out there one day and nothing. everything, nothing but stems. Oh, no. <laughs> aggravating. Yes, very aggravating. Anything else we can do for you? Uh, the seaweed you talked about, Yes. Uh, you can get that about anywhere? Well, um, I would like to say that you can. Um, I know that you can from the larger stores. Yeah, like Lowe's uh, and Home Lowe's, Depot. Lowe's, Menards, Home Depot, places like that. If you go in and you specifically ask for it. Now, I have for asked liquid down on the seaweed. fill there if they would start carrying kelp um, and uh, liquid seaweed. And look on there, make sure that it's an organic, uh, and, and some of them have fish emulsion in them, that's fine because it's odorless. Um, uh, I don't like it mixed with fish emulsion because the uh, fragrance of the fish fragrance? attracts. <laughs> the stench. Well, it's, it, if they descend it, it's not stench. Yeah, it stinks. But it, it attracts uh, skunks. Yeah, and critters. you really don't, you know, I've got enough the problems without fish. That's there being need. fish out there, uh, skunks out there. Mm -hmm. And if you use the seaweed, though, be very careful fertilizer. about the deer. Deer okay. love salt. Okay. And if you're fertilizing with seaweed, you're going to compound your problems by attracting animals. So what I do is I do not apply seaweed until the animals have plenty to eat elsewhere. Okay. So that's usually about the uh, 15th of next month. Yeah, it's the things okay. you put out early before everything else has bloomed and sprouted that take the hardest hit because they're the only thing there is. And so. seaweed, there is nothing that is more complete oh what a seaweed. fertilizer it really every is every awesome. mineral every trace element uh so it makes your plants stronger they just and look, immune they just look stronger they look and greener green. and i used to i used to have the only organic lawn care uh in um in well in east central indiana i think in uh in in quite an area here and we got all of our products out of canada and it was all uh, these big 55 gallon drums of kelp and the lawns that we sprayed were so such a bluish green it was uh, it took some time but they were just fabulous and i, I grew all my crops with that too so uh, but it is worth trying to find, and I think you'll find that anything that you spray with that. Now, we do the normal uh, peat moss and, and side dressing with regular fertilizer. But mm -hmm. anything that you spray with seaweed, tomatoes will taste better. Uh, uh, all of your cucumbers will, will have a different flavor to them. They have, have more, more earth in them, more 
nutrients in them. So and it comes they have in a bottle, if I remember right, because I think I still have a bottle. It comes in a bottle of like a concentrate, kind of like a... Mm -hmm. So you, you know, dilute it down. A, a goo, yeah. and you dilute it either in a, a pail of water, or I think you can apply it in sprayers or lawn applicators, different kinds of things. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. a concentrated liquid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank right. you very much for your call. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. Well, so much. my well, goodness. Thank you for calling. All right. We appreciate your call very, very much. Well, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. We got uh, uh, well, Deidre Anderson. Are you on the line with us? Yes. Can, Hi. What can we do for you? I have a weed growing in my backyard. Actually, it has taken over my whole backyard. Okay. And it has a little tendency to be a little viney, but it has a purple bloom on the top of it. And I was hoping you could guess what that would be and what would get rid of it. Is it that tubular looking purple thing? Yes. You know the one. It, it's about this tall. It's yeah. like a purple worm, a fuzzy purple worm. Yeah, it's um I'm trying I'm trying to think it's I have it too. If it's purge <laughs> or if it's well um identifying the weed is not as much an issue as identifying what to do about it. Right. The number one thing, how much shade is in that yard? Uh, not very much. Okay, so you're in a, in a, a full sun area, and it's a long-term yard. It's been there for a while? Uh, no, it actually hasn't been here for a long period of time. I just started in a couple of years noticing it coming around my flower beds, and then it gets yeah, a little right. more, but a little the, bit more. But now your, almost the whole backyard is covered with it. But your lawn has been there for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And you've just noticed it coming in there. What has happened in part is that the pH of your lawn has been progressively going south or going uh, to the acid side. And mm -hmm. as that transformation occurs in the lawn, and this happens uh, uh, more rapidly in a, in a lawn that has heavy shade, as this transformation happens, you get um, soil that is less conducive to the growth of grass and more conducive to the growth of weeds and, and other things that we don't want in there. Right. The, there's a number of things that will kill it, but the best thing to do is to try to correct the situation. Ideally, you would take a sample of the lawn, uh, of the soil that's in the lawn, as uh, prescribed by the uh, extension office. Go around and take three or four or five different places and mix it up together and bring it into them. And they will give you a full analysis of your soil condition of your lawn, what, what it has and what it's lacking and what it needs to grow the proper lawn. You will probably discover that you are lacking on uh, perhaps uh, iron, buron, and I would assume that your pH is uh, too low. If you add those products, that instead of that uh, taking over more and more, it will decrease and it will go away on its own. Oh. But it's better if you add those products and wait a little while because this, uh, when you do an organic or a natural corrective to your lawn, it's a slower process than going out and wham, knocking it with a killer and then wham, throwing some new seed. Yeah. And, uh, but if you do it the fast way, you're, it's going to come right back again and you're going you're gonna to repeat this cycle over and over. So I would strongly recommend that you get a soil analysis uh, follow their uh, directions and instructions, put down the products that they suggest at the rate that they suggest, and then also uh, look at the future. It, sometimes it'll say put down 50 pounds per acre this year and then 100 pounds per acre next year or something like that. And follow those recommendations. And now what you'll have is you'll have a, um, an area that is more likely to grow grass and less likely to grow weeds. So now you can go in with a weed and feed and you can uh, put, uh, put the weed and feed on about uh, August. Go back in the end of August, 1st of September, throw some grass seed um, and, and use a tall fescue. Don't use any blue grasses or anything that's not fit for this area. Tall fescue 
is the most colorful, the, the most, um, uh, covers oh, the most ground. It's very soft. It's easy to mow. It's drought resistant. It, there is more than one blend, so it's not all one pure seed. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more recommended. So basically you would want to correct the soil that is the growing environment for the weeds mm -hmm. and make it more suitable for grass. Now, if it's, if you, in your opinion, if it's possibly acidic right now and that's making the weeds like it better would adding lime to the lawn well, yeah that'll be one, be one of the recommendations go? but it, it it could be that it's buron i've i've had some yards where it was iron and buron but uh -huh. um uh it's quite possible that you will have to add lime now we put the lime on lime uh you may have to uh, like i said apply it more than once to bring the ph up and that's a gradual process. So this may be an investment for next spring. Because yeah, what if you're like me and you don't really want to take soil samples to the extension office and you have these weeds? Just tell me and what to put on it. you don't follow the garden doctor's <laughs> advice. Well, just tell me to put lime on it or something. If I see you at, a, at the grocery store, I will chase you down with my cart. And I will severely. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the the um, uh, that that is the ideal way to go, and people ha have a problem waiting, you know, patiently. So there is another way, like me? if you wish. Okay. If you have this weed and you you're not really sure what it is, go I'm to not. the list of weeds. Go down through it because there, there's there's a list of weeds, believe it or not, on every package that is sold. You can go to their website and they will list all of the weeds that they will kill by that weed and feed or by this weed and Do feed. Do they show pictures and everything? They show yeah. pictures and everything, Trefland, whatever, and identify it and say, okay, there it is right there. And buy the product and to kill that This is that the product weed. that will kill it. And then look to see what the product recommends is the best timing and the mm -hmm. best approach and the best method. Now, you may kill the weed, but it may come right back again once that weed control has gone away. If the soil has not so, been If improved. you haven't corrected the problem, right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else we can answer for you? Uh, is it uh, a good time to divide my pineys? My peonies? Uh, you can call them pineys. Depends on what side of the tracks you're on. You know, we, we know where you come from if you call them pineys. Yeah. We, we, we've got your number. Peonies, okay. on the other hand, we're not sure. You could have been from over here, over here. I'd never heard of a piney till I moved here. So <laughs> she thought we were talking about trees. Or I don't know, piney tree. The division <laughs> of peonies or peonies is. Uh -huh. um, uh, can be done in the fall or in the spring. Because they're getting the ready spring, to bloom right now. I see mine are all sprout yeah, the now. The problem with doing it now is that you've already got the foliage up. And right. you're going to be digging them up with the foliage already come out, which that's what puts the energy back down into the bulb. But what okay. takes the most energy out of the bulb is the blossom. So if you do, if you are going to do it in the spring, do it now. Don't wait. Okay. Cut the bloom, cut all of the, the growth off. Let them dry out in the sun a little bit. Look for any damaged roots. But or, you can forget about your bloom this year if you're yeah, taking you will not have out. a blossom. No. Okay. So uh, you, won't. You, you won't have any, any uh, repeat bloom on this year. So what, you, what you'll have to do is you're, you're going to let them dry out. Then you're going to put them in a bag with some baby powder. Shake it up real good because they are a root crop. They need to be protected from certain cutworms. That's mm -hmm. the finest glass you can find is baby powder. Cutworms will not go anywhere near it. Uh, they hate the taste of it. So it's, it's a real good protective. Put some bone meal down in the soil. Make sure you plant these peonies where they get full sunlight and you can get the, the full benefit from them. Uh, and um, uh, you want to uh, divide the roots up, separate them out, you know, plant them at the depth that they should be, which is usually about 8 inches, I believe, 8 to 10 inches. Uh, I, I always plant things about two inches deeper than they recommend because I want things to be stronger and come from a deeper, mm -hmm. deeper in the soil. So, sense. and then always side dress your peonies. They like uh, some uh, some cow manure or some natural organics around them every once in a while. Okay. All right. Thank you All very right, much for your you. call. Thank you. And we have another caller on the line. Go ahead. You're on with the Mr. and Mrs. Garden Doctor. Hello, Hello Dave. Everyone. How you doing? Yes, I'd like to know which uh, vegetables do not uh, should be planted together. 
are planted next to each other. Oh, that's that's a fantastic idea. Companion crop gardening is a fascinating field. It is absolutely amazing what can be accomplished by putting a plant beside another plant that likes the other plant. Or what can be damaged by putting the wrong plants together. Well, I now, learned about this at one time as a child. And of course, I grew up in Miami, Florida, lived in South Florida my whole life. Every piece of food ever came from a grocery store. But my grandparents lived in Mountain City, Tennessee, a little town out in the hills of Tennessee. And when I was a kid, I saw how they did this. They plant corn, every stalk of corn, has beans planted around it mm -hmm. and the beans would grow up this corn stalk. It's a and symbiotic I relationship. I thought that was just amazing. <laughs> how brilliant to plant a, a actual stalk Well, for and beans. there's a couple of reasons for what she's talking about and that is that the stalk of the corn provided the Something vine to climb. For, yep. the, for the bean but they're also compatible. The bean draws the nutrients up from the bottom. The corn is a high nitrogen uh, demanding plant uh, and the so it it absorbs all of that nitrogen that's being drawn up from the bean, and the bean is is a plant that is uh, that fixes the nitrogen and draws it up. So they they work very very well together, uh, and uh, we try to plant those things. There are many things, and I wish I had boned up a little bit on. Com uh, well, we on had the compatibility. this. Um, well, that's I did a right. show He's one time where we did the show, and we did a we had a whole sheet of companion plants yeah, that and, went together. I don't have that. We've in had front some of me interest now. with that before, but let me tell you about a couple of plants. Yes, tomatoes and basil. Uh, my son would like to say basil. He has to catch himself. He has that. to really catch himself. <laughs> Christopher. Basil. So, you know, but uh, if you ever see him out anywhere, say, so oh, basil. hi, Basil. And um, uh, he'll, he'll love you for that. He'll love me for that. But uh, you want to plant tomatoes together with, with uh, basil, basil. And you definitely want uh, to plant um, uh, corn in conjunction with uh, beans. And if you can plant them in between where you put two rows of corn, two rows of beans, and then rotate that, you're going to do uh, the soil a, a great justice, uh, and you can do it an injustice if you plant corn over and over again in the same soil because it just depletes the soil completely. Uh, but beyond that, my list of, of know, compatibility blank. stuff has uh, has kind of gone way the wayside. <laughs> Sorry, can't had, remember that one. We had a bunch of, I forgot my papers. I usually have them all typed up nice, nice and neat, but we had so many people called in and they said, when is this plant dead? When do I just rip these roses out and throw them away? When is this tree that I've been waiting for it to leaf out? When is it dead? When can <laughs> I give can up sure? on this thing? <laughs> well, it's still too early. We still have not had the nighttime warming temperatures that we need to stimulate all of the growth that might still be lying in there. And I have seen plants be resurrected where I was certain that this plant has done, but I didn't have time to take it out. So I went somewhere else and helped somebody else do something and somewhere else and somewhere, and then come back and the plant has got some green on it. So don't be too quick to pull plants out, but there is a time. And that time usually we think is the 15th of next month. If by the middle of next month you have a tree or a shrub or a plant which has not resulted, then it's time to, to, well, to do away with I that, still, with one exception. It won't get do away with the hibiscus. Don't <laughs> ever do away with the hibiscus. Because they will surprise you. Well, they don't even start until June. They're not so. even thinking about it yet. So not even thinking about blooming out yet. Yeah, uh, the they, they, uh, hibiscus is one that will really sneak up on you. I think we have another caller. Go ahead. You're All on right, the air right. with the garden doctor. How can we help you? Oh, yes, I have a question about walnut trees around gardens. Yes. Uh, to get rid of the acid and stuff from the walnut tree to help your garden? Uh, <laughs> walnut trees and gardens do not mix. Uh, walnut trees that are growing along the edge of a cornfield, they will have an effect on the corn growing, the soybeans growing in that commercial field. Walnut tree produces a gas that restricts competition. And the reason it does that is because it's such a slow grower without nature giving it this edge. 
and this ability to, to slow and even stop the growth of many, many things around it, it would not ever have the opportunity to oh, grow. It would get taken over grow. a long time ago, huh? The foliage that falls off the walnut tree and the fruit that falls off the walnut tree contain a portion of this um, this gas, this juggalo, and it uh, is it's very toxic to your your um, uh, garden, uh, especially if it's fermented. It even makes it even more toxic. So, growing a garden around walnut trees is not recommended at all. Now, it can be done. Uh, and there are certain plants, tomatoes really, really don't like it around there, and there are other plants that will, will grow uh, very weak. So, um, Is there anything that uh, likes it? That n not around a walnut tree. I don't know of any plant that, um, that we have, um, we've put uh, hosta and everything else under walnut tree and they have been slowed down uh, in their growth. Uh, mm. Even the ferns, uh, when they do start to repopulate under mature walnut trees, they're just not as strong and, and vigorous as they would be under other, other plants. So unless you have an area that is to the south side of the walnut trees where the uh, effect would be lessened by not allowing the leaves and the foliage to accumulate there um, the root structure even puts off a gas so uh, if the roots grow underneath this this can be uh, problematic but um, um, Geez, was that enough good information, for, uh, good good news for you? <laughs> well, no. Now, how to kill a walnut tree? Talk to your neighbors. <laughs> Call walnut, us after the show. We walnut have trees good have good value, um, and you might want to convince the neighbor to look into the possibility that, hey, this tree may be worth fifty, hundred dollars. Uh, you know, we'll, I'll cut it down, and uh, we'll split the difference. Um, uh, if the tree is leaning over on your side to a certain degree, you may have some uh, legitimate um, legal uh, rights that you can exercise, but, uh, you know, you have to look into that. Can with, they roll the disclaimer a, across yeah. the screen right look now? This a, is not a different legal source. advice. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I really, walnuts are just really a problem. Uh, they are a beautiful tree. The, uh, I have my own sawmill, and I love... Uh, you have to wear a mask because yeah, you can't even cut the, it or the, turn it. The dust that comes off from the toxic. sawdust is toxic to you. Uh, if it gets into your lungs, uh, yeah, Ron Kramer, can, a friend of mine who's passed away now, but he's a wood, was a wood turner, and using the files and put the wood on the lathe made him so sick he swore he'd never turn another piece. But again, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, uh, it has do? a purpose. Uh, love the love to eat the nuts. Uh, it's even a healing plant. But it just doesn't like gardens. Oh, Anything okay. else we can do for you? No, that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I feel bad, well, and that's all well, I have to say you know, about that. Yeah, because <laughs> really, I, I can't. Uh, there's <laughs> not a thing you can do. We have tried you in elevated gardens. We have tried everything, and a walnut tree just produces this natural thing. You know, it, it wants its own bubble yeah. to grow in. All right, we're going to go to the video Let's take a of look the at our garden, garden doctor's yeah. garden. That looks pretty good. Let's see what that looks like. Hello, and welcome to the garden doctor and Mrs. Garden Doctor's backyard. This is our garden. We have a garden in the front yard. We have a garden in the side yard. We have a garden in the other side yard. And then we have a garden in our backyard. And this one is the backyard garden. Now, we rotate gardens around, and we some of them will be flower gardens one year, and the next year they'll be vegetable gardens. Back here, I tried to go a little bit early this year. May 10th is the frost-free date. They've moved that back because we supposedly moved into a different climate zone. Um, and so now they're, they're saying that uh, any time after the 1st of May is safe. Well, uh, you can still get a frost after the 1st of May, but the chances are very slim. 
I tried to plant tomatoes about two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, my attempts, uh, you can see over here to the far, to my far left here, uh, that uh, tomato got frosted quite uh, severely. The next tomato, uh, not quite as badly. And the reason that progressively you'll see that these tomatoes were less and less frosted was because we had a fire burning out here and the warmth that, that was provided in the air kept them warm. Now, way down on the end there, I've got a, a rhubarb to replace some of the rhubarb that is growing on the other side of uh, the, the uh, farm here, and it's just not getting enough sun. Right back here, I've got some radishes coming up. Uh, you can see the package here, and uh, you can see the radishes just sprouting through, I'm hoping. Uh, you can see them in the camera. And radishes come through very, very quickly. Oh, five to seven days, the radishes will pop poke up through the ground. So they're a good plant to use to identify a row. Like if you've got something that's very slow in growing, like uh, perhaps carrots or something, use the radishes to identify the row. By the time you've harvested the uh, radishes, the carrots have come up and so that you you know where the row is. Now you, if you'll notice here, there's a lot of straw around me and this straw is here for uh, a number of reasons. It holds the moisture in. It also holds the weeds down. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret that I have not told my wife, and she's the one that put all this straw out here and did a, did a beautiful job of it. However, if you just, as you, if you're going to use straw to put down on your yard, uh, make sure that you put down a layer of newspaper first. Now, this newspaper will hold the weeds down far superior to just straw. And by covering up that newspaper, uh, it will rot and decay underneath there. Uh, you see my, my uh, steed here, Toby, is uh, protecting me. Paper bags work very effectively too, but you don't need the whole bag. You can cut it and just use one layer of it uh, and uh, underneath there. Now, straw has a tendency to be a little volatile when it comes to um, uh, burning. So you want to be careful with straw. Um, always keep it moist. That's the whole purpose of it being down there. If you have a problem with it blowing around and your ground is very clay, then you should add some sand to hold down the straw and also the sand will eventually, as the straw breaks down, work the sand and the straw into the ground and uh, that will break the clay up and it'll do a tremendous job of um, uh, uh, improving the quality of your soil. Uh, now we have covered our garden all the way out through here. There's beans growing out here or uh, just getting ready to pop through the ground. And I'm going to take you over to our patch of early uh, weather crops that we've got inside the fence there. It'll just be a moment and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Uh, I'm inside the cage here. This is actually a dog pen, and a do this has a, been a fantastic tool for us. We've been able to keep all the critters that we don't want to chew on our food on the outside and uh, leaving it for the people that we want to chew on the food, which is us. We've got Swiss chard in here, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, uh, there's some kale over in the background there, and all of these plants are planted just a little bit close together. This is closer than I would normally recommend, and the reason that I do that is because we harvest off the outer branches on a continuous basis to juice them, and these work out fabulously for that purpose. Now, on the entire outside, you'll see where I have tilled a path all the way around the outside. That will be used for the tomato plants. As these inside grow, they are cold weather crops, and we've planted them way earlier, planted them about three weeks ago. They're going to have a tremendous head start. They're going to grow into the, the warmth of the season. By having the tomatoes grow up on the outside, that will provide some shade to keep it cool in here so that they will continue to produce long after they normally would without this type of environmental condition. So right now they're in the full sun. They've got the straw around them to hold the moisture in. Uh, but not too much moisture. If we start getting too much rain, we'll actually pull this back away to protect uh, uh, the plants. We're, we're keeping the rabbits out, and we have a big problem with rabbits around here, and we're keeping the deer out, and actually the geese, the ducks, and if you'll notice my wife's ribbons, we're also keeping out the birds. Thank you very much for visiting us in our garden in the backyard. We'll try to bring you more and show you how this looks in about a month from now. Thank you again. Back to the studio.
Hello, welcome back. Still live, right up there. Did you see that cute little dog in the video? That's Gorgeous a, dog. Oh, little Toby dog. That yeah. is a vicious critter. I wouldn't, you know, you come out to visit, you have to be very, very careful. He's one of the critters we're trying to keep out of that caged-in uh, garden area, too, oh, Lord, but it only works see. when the gate's closed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How he chases rabbits is he barks at them, waits for them to get a way head start, and then he'll go loping after them. No, he's no tiny dog, that's for sure. No. He's awful cute, but he's not the hunter she was. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Bud Whipple and his wife called about their uh, Japanese red leaf maple. And they. Mind your own business. Oh, <laughs> and they're, um, uh, they were concerned that only half of it had leafed out. And the side that had leafed out, um, um, it's a beautiful tree, it's right in the center of their front yard. And the side that had leafed out looks like it's leafing out pretty good. And the other side, there's absolutely nothing. Now, it's not uncommon for an older tree like this one is. This uh, red leaf jet maple's been there as long as I can remember, and I've been taking care of the house uh, back and forth most of the time it's been there. So um, 20, 25 years it's probably been there. And it's an older tree, but they do live to be uh, 75, 100 years old. Oh, do old. they? Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Some of the varieties. Some varieties, not so much. Up on 30th Street, as you're going over the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. headed out of town on the left just as you get almost to the height of the land on the left there is the largest oldest red leaf dwarf Japanese maple that I know that. of in this whole area now that one may not have survived either I don't know because I haven't been up by that way and it's still a little bit early to tell but I used to recommend Leland's and one of the questions was do you still recommend Leland's? Leland's is a particular evergreen that I really like. And this lovely lady, her last name is Stein, she lives in this area. She told me that her daughter had this beautiful tree in its backyard, and I really should look into getting some of them. And she told me what it was. She went in, found the tag, and brought it back out. And I studied up on it, and I said, wow, this is, this is really good. I'm always interested to find something new, something different to plant. So I studied up on this plant. I went and talked to a couple of people. I called a few friends of mine at the universities. Done any studies, any tests? Yeah, this is a good plant. Really good plant for this area. So I got into the Leland's, and the more I planted them, the more I liked them, the more I liked them. Is that the columnar? Is it a no? They're kind of an open evergreen. Okay. They're. Uh, I was I was getting a little disappointed with white pine because of the sudden pine death, and we had other problems mm -hmm. yeah. with white pine. So I I was getting away from the white pine, and I still love uh, the spruce. Uh, highly recommend the spruce, but. Uh, for some variety, you know, and for some speed of growth, the Leland seemed to be one of the perfect plants. So we started planting a few of them, not very many, but a few, and I started moving them up my list of, of recommended plants. Put in two for Ron Goldiron down there. That worked out quite well. <clears throat> ah, there are two brown spots on either side of his yard down there, you'll notice. Everything else is nice and green and gorgeous. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're dead yet, but uh, you have to be careful. You can't just jump into these brand new plants. That's what happened with the Bradford pear. Everybody started saying, Bradford pear in the in the brain. Oh, I gotta have one of those. And everybody bought one before Aren't they even a, found out yeah. that it had a weak crown and that it was a very, very poor hybrid. The, Extremely poor. Those are the ones you would see broken along the railroad Busted tracks after a storm. And down, right. and yeah, mm -hmm. they just split all apart and everything. Just didn't hold up. And they finally they hybrid them enough to where they got a good strong crown. Uh, the Cleveland Select. Uh, there's two or three other varieties that are hybrids that have they've got away from that multiple crown business so so they've done a much better job so the question was do I still recommend the Leland Evergreen no not at this time doesn't mean that I won't again in the future because I haven't seen if this one's going to come back out of it yet or not but right now no I absolutely don't next qu another question was sod when can I put in sod well uh, call our friends down at uh, Monster Turf. Uh, best sod, uh, the only sod grower in this area, so I'm not afraid to mention the name. Uh, and they do an exceptional job. Nice uh, people, too. Uh, Eugene, Eugene and, and Susan Sue. down there, I think. And uh, uh, do a fabulous job. It's very good sod. And don't ask for bluegrass. They grow it because people ask for it. Ask for fescue. 
put in fescue, you'll be much happier. And you'll be even happier if you just tell them to put it in because <laughs> yeah. it's quite a bit of work. It is. Work. It's a job. And they now have these machines that are they're, uh, they're like 8 foot wide, 10 foot wide, 12 foot wide. I don't even know. Giant rolls like carpet. And they, one minute you have no lawn, the next minute you have a lawn and you're ready to play golf. Okay, so then we had questions about uh, blue spruce or white pine, what evergreens can I have? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm recommending. Eh, I got a problem with the, there was a, a piece in the paper that said the, the, the blue spruce downtown in front of the courthouse succumbed to the, um, uh, the bagworm. They fell victim. Fell victim to the bagworm. The bagworm. Well, I have no question that the... Uh, the person that wrote that meant every word of it and believed every word of it, researched it, did, their, did the things they're supposed to do. But in fact, those plants fell victim to just being ignored just being allowed to be consumed by uh, this bagworm. The bagworm, in fact, can be controlled, could have been controlled, and way, way back in a story that we did uh, here on this yes, show. Yes, we and showed that photos. We uh -huh. had photos, and I said, if you want to see what a bagworm looks like, so you'll be sure, you can visit the, uh, the up at the park. We had some arborvada that were infested with bagworm. Uh, and uh, there was a lady that was kind enough to let us use her spruce tree on 28th Street, I think it was, as an example. People drove by there to see what it looked like. Because we saved that tree by removing we the bagworms. We saved that tree by picking the bagworms by hand off of it. And it really wasn't that difficult. And we also mentioned the, the, the courthouse. You could see bagworms on there, which we were certain would be addressed. And then we mentioned it again in the show a little bit later. But what I did was that it really disturbs me that 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 tree was well those look trees at the expense of removing the well, tree first of all let's yeah, go there they could have but. been saved they could have been pruned back there's a lot of things that could have been done but i asked my wife she's a novice at this if she could in just an afternoon at two o'clock this afternoon i said you look up and see if you can figure out how to control bagworms I'm not going to give you any guidance and see what you can do. And there is a wealth of knowledge in this town that knows how to control bagworms. If somebody had just asked, and I'm sure there's people that knew. This was by choice that these trees were taken down. So, did you find the answers? Well, I found a lot of information. I definitely did. And I actually looked up and referred to the Purdue Extension publication that they referred to in this mm -hmm. uh, newspaper article, which I printed out here. Great information here. And it talks about the life of the bagworm and the life cycle of the bagworm and how to control them. Now, what they do is this worm will start building a cocoon on its body as it eats. It, it literally moves. It eats and moves so much every day. And it builds this cocoon around its body. When does it so do this? It's, it, the eggs hatch out in early June. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get my timeline straight. Yes, the eggs hatch out for in early June, turn into a little caterpillar, start this cycle of building the cocoon while it's eating the tree. By late um, July, uh, August and early September, that cocoon is finished. It's about two inches long. And once it is done eating, the caterpillar attaches it to the tree where it is permanently, closes itself off. From that point on, that cocoon is not able to be killed by any chemical it's process. It's impenetrable. It is impenetrable. The only time really to kill the bagworms, if you're going to use sprays, is after they have hatched and become little, cat little caterpillars while they are still young, but while their bags that they're making are an inch or less in size. Or actually, while they're but here in is their the lava thing. form. They're not, well, they don't even have bags that's right. as when they hatch. That's right. As the eggs hatch. Okay. From the time the eggs hatch till they're up to about an inch is the best time to spray the tree, the foliage of the tree, to kill the worms because the worms have to, or the caterpillars, the worms, whatever, have to actually eat the foliage that's been treated for two, one or, uh, two or three days before it actually kills them. Now here's the thing, and all of the things that I looked up from Purdue to uh, pro, you know private websites, everything else, it tells you that the best way to control bagworms is to pick them off. Um, that's really the simplest, cheapest, 
a non-toxic way to do is pick off the bags that you can reach. Sometimes that's going to be harder on a larger well, tree. Well, in all reality, when you get up to a certain size of you tree, can't that's really very, do very that. difficult. It is difficult. It's very difficult. But by picking them in their early stages, you're only talking about picking a few, not millions. And while they're young and spinning their little web, they actually can fly off to other trees and attach themselves, and that's how they spread to other trees in close proximity. Ralph Newquist, uh, Bill Newquist, and uh, Paul Stein had a number of giant spruce in their yards. Uh, blue spruce, Norway spruce, and so forth that were infested with bagworm. And we went in with ladders and we spent a little time and we picked the worms. And then when we had decreased the population and we got the population somewhat under control by the hand picking, which, which I must admit was a little time consuming, then we attacked, attacked it on an individual basis by them watching when the hatch occurred. When the hatch occurred, we went out and sprayed it. Now here's they had no issue. bagworms for the next 25 years. You don't necessarily have to spray the foliage to do it that way. If you want to do it that way, that's a topical solution. You can also treat the soil around the tree, so you're treating the tree systemically. You want to do that earlier in, say, May, so that by the time the, the, cat, the eggs have hatched and start eating, that is already systemically in the tree and in the needles and in the foliage. The point I wanted to get across is just because one tree goes down to bagworm does not mean if your tree has bagworms, it's doomed. No. There are ways to treat that and one of the best ways is that first you need to know what a, a bagworm looks like you need to be able to identify it get it off there uh, if somebody needs help getting it off there get it off for them don't let them climb up a ladder if they shouldn't be up on the ladder picking bagworms you know and but you pick them and put them in soapy water drown them submerge them we used to actually them. put them in kerosene and then we would use them for fire yeah, light them on fire we, we did that for them. years the, you know, the scouts they'd wrap them up and we, we had bagworms that uh, Boy Scouts would go out, we'd pick bagworms off in trees for people. and uh, But don't give up on your tree just because it's got a couple of bagworms on it. Now the question is, when you cut down a tree that is completely full of bagworms, that was what next do you question. do with the tree? Right. You have to burn it or properly dispose of it. From what I read, the best thing you could have done is wait now until all of the caterpillars and their tents are completely mature and sealed. Then you cut the tree well, and transport it. Sure, wherever ideally that would it. be in September okay, or but October, right? Now, right? Yeah, you're going to, and they maybe the eggs haven't hatched out yet, but they're going to wherever this tree lay right now if it's not burnt. Well, chewing it up is not going uh, to, does not, it has does to not be burnt. Burn. Yeah, you have to burn it. And, and uh, we try to do that uh, very. Uh, quickly, we but I was sad to see that time. because we yeah. showed pictures of that two years ago about an infestation. And Beautiful, I, big blue spruce. I didn't think we needed to go down there and pick it and spray it ourselves. Well, I would but have, <laughs> but again, we have a we have a problem in Indiana. Well, you can't volunteer to do something. You have to have an uh, act of Congress. Well, of course, the government has to allocate money to do that. So um, anyway, um, I it did, that was just very disturbing. I tried yeah. to not, not to get involved in too much uh, local. Well, you can pay to pick and spray, or you can pay to cut the tree down. I guess we're going to cut the tree down and it's gone. We want to, so again, we want to compliment uh, <laughs> Jennifer and Christopher. Great they're, job. They're, they're Yay. Great job on their show and a great job to Taylor and Rowan. Yay. Taylor, you did good. <laughs> Rowan, you did better. Yeah, they did you great really job. controlled yourself. Ooh. I was I was absolutely shocked. So cute. I was amazed. And uh, everybody in New Hampshire is now able to, uh, uh, they, they just came up streaming in the, or, or some way where they can figure it out. So some Dad's new hip is friends. running like a champ. Go, Dad. Yeah, friends and relatives up there doing well. Her son, uh, which we brought back with yes. us, update on him. He's, He's doing improving. very well. He's improving. He's going uh, to the heart doctor, being monitored, getting preparing for surgery probably. You'll see me walking time. around with a limp wing here He's in the near future. He's getting operated on his hands Surgery here both sides and knee and I don't know. A lot going on, yes. Uh, she, she gets her brain adjusted. Yeah, well, and us it, and the whole before. rest of the world has ah, a lot going on, that's for that's sure. That's right, that's right. And we wish and you gardening. all well. Uh, and we're going to give you an update on our garden in uh, 30 days from now. And get out and there and fish. The white bass are running. That's what I hear. Weekdays. Homegrown is weekdays at 5.30 5 5 30 p.m. That's my that's, son's yes. and uh, our daughter-in-law's show. Yes. And we want to uh, 
get you to tune into that and give us some comments. Call us. Uh, let us know what you and think of the show. We have a new viewer. Hi, Georgette. If you're watching, yes, just hello, got Georgette. TV3. She just got back. She's got TV3. That's Yay. great. Uh, uh, people, other people can get it now, too. That's right. Thank you very much for watching. We appreciate every one of your calls. We appreciate all of your prayers and all of your good wishes for all of yes, our health issues and, and uh, everything else that goes on in our lives. And, and we're sending it right back out to you. Thank you very much. Garden Doctor